Hello, my name is Kyle Matthews. I'm executive director of the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies at Concordia University. And we're very pleased today to continue our Digital Authoritarianism Speakers a series that's done in partnership with the U.S. Embassy to Canada, as well as the U.S. Consulate uh, General to Montreal. Um, this session is extremely important and fascinating. Uh, we've been discussing a bit in our past events about the role of China in using uh, emerging digital technologies for authoritarian purposes. Um, our last events we, we had at Wright City in which we had a panel on digital authoritarianism. We also had a, a really high level event at uh, RightsCon in June. But today we're really gonna dig into the issue of China. So this session is called The Great Firewall, China's Model of Digital Control. And this is a issue of, of, of China and, and, and digital technology is one that's coming on to the human rights uh, agenda, to the international security agenda, and also needs more collaboration between American uh, academics, think tankers, in, and also in Canada to work together to understand what's happening. So uh, we have four extremely uh, distinguished speakers today. Um, I'll introduce them uh, briefly. And in that order of proceeding, they will have a few minutes to talk about how their work intersects with this issue of digital authoritarianism in China. So first speaker is Paul Mosher of the New York Times technology correspondent focused on the intersection of technology and geopolitics in Asia. Thank you for joining us, Paul. We have, yeah, we have Dr. Sheena Greitens, Associate Professor at the University of Texas of Austin at the LBJ School and Faculty Fellow at the Clement Center for National Security. Thank you for joining us, Sheena. Thanks for having me. Uh, we also have a Canadian with us today, Margaret McQuaig Johnson, a good friend of MIGS, who's a Senior Fellow at the Institute for Science, Society and Policy at the University of Ottawa. Thank you for joining us, Margaret. Great to be here. And last but not least, we have Aniki Rikonen, who's a research assistant for the Technology and National Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. Thank you, Aniki, for joining us. Thanks so much, Kyle, for hosting. So I'm gonna ask each of our speakers to uh, say a few opening words. Followed by that, I have a set of questions that I would like to ask and have a general discussion. And we're gonna leave the remaining 15, 20 minutes of today's one hour long panel discussion to take questions from the audience. So if any of you are following this right now on Facebook or YouTube, please um, think about what you'd like to ask, if it's directed towards one person or towards the entire uh, panel, but you can send that in a message and I will read that off when the time comes. So maybe I'll just uh, pass the floor to Paul. Um, you're, you're a journalist, you have a very interesting perspective on this from your reporting and your, and your, and your work. Maybe I'd, I'd just like to see the floor to you and have you make a few opening comments. Yeah, sure. So um, I've been covering uh, China for, I guess, 14 years now and technology in China for maybe 10 of that. Um, and so maybe by quick introduction, I can kind of walk us very quickly through some of the different tech authoritarianism sort of turns uh, that we've seen historically. So, you know, all the way back to 2009, I, I went out to Xinjiang um, right after uh, the sort of the riots there and covered what was one of the, at the time, the first internet blackouts. And so at that moment, you know, internet had basically been cut off uh, in Xinjiang. And that led to a couple of the um, sort of more high profile blocks uh, that happened, you know, into Facebook and YouTube and, and sort of foreign platforms like that from the Chinese internet. Um, you know, and then going forward, uh, you know, over the course of my career in China, we just sort of saw, you know, the only safe bet was that new sites would be blocked and that, that there would be new censorship. And, you know, every year we just saw that ratchet up and ratchet up. Um, and then, you know, in the past couple of years, uh, things have gotten quite interesting uh, as we've seen the technology get more sophisticated and officials get quite a bit more daring in terms of how they were experimenting with using it towards the aim of social control. And so a lot of people have probably seen, you know, reports about uh, the use of, of uh, facial recognition and, and the sort of ubiquity of surveillance cameras within China. Um, you know, I did a lot of reporting over the past few years out of Xinjiang and kind of looking at how uh, just the sheer density of cameras and the ways that the kind of uh, checkpoint there's sort of this checkpoint system in Xinjiang where you can you know, basically look at a person's face and cl clock who they are as they go through different places, as they go into a bank, as they go to a gas station. So kind of putting together how that works. We also kind of discovered that um, uh, one of the things China does is actually embed uh, ethnicity detection within its algorithms around the country. So uh, it's actually looking out actively for the ethnic minority Uyghurs uh, as people pass by cameras all across the country. Um, you know, and then more recently, 
also looked at Hong Kong um, and kind of, you know, during the protests there sort of saw what the kind of awareness of what was happening in China did to the ideas of what democracy would be for Hong Kong, you know, as short lived as those ideas were and how people there thought about, you know, what what ultimately uh, uh, you know was required to have to have democracy, and that meant obviously a lot of pushback against some of the more physical surveillance that we've seen. Um, there's a lot more I, I can talk about, but let's I'll just cut it off there, and that kind of takes us to the current day. We were thrown out of China uh, a year and a half ago now, I guess, um, and so I've been in Taiwan since, uh, trying to cover it from here. Uh, kind of the beginning of the pandemic, we got thrown out. Thank you, Paul. Fascinating work, and thank you for your reporting. Uh, we've definitely been reading up it from from uh, Canada, and appreciate the important uh, work you're doing as a journalist. Um, I'd now like to pass the floor to to Sheena, um, who's done a lot of work on authoritarianism and and and, and the Chinese perspectives of national security. Um, Sheena, the the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so, so first of all, just want to second um, the the accolades for Paul's reporting. He and his colleagues have done us just a tremendous service in terms of understanding some of the nuts and bolts of this system and some of the important features of of how it works on the ground. Um, what I wanted to do maybe to, to complement and to build on that is to pull back a little bit and to look at the political context um, around that, that this surveillance buildup has occurred in. Um, and I think because I think that's an important framing. What is the what is the purpose of this? Why is the party state doing it? How is Xi Jinping um, and his colleagues in Chinese senior leadership thinking about um, the role of the surveillance state? <clears throat> and I want to start in 2014, 2015, when Xi Jinping rolled out something that he's referred to as the comprehensive national security concept. Um, this was something that uh, premiered in 2014 and sort of was formally incorporated into a national security strategy that was approved by the Politburo in um, the spring of the following year. And the comprehensive national security concept has really become a touchstone of Xi Jinping's time in power and a reference point from which we can understand a whole bunch of the different things he's done from the surveillance buildup to the overhaul of legal and bureaucratic um, pieces of China's party state system um, to some of its foreign policy. But the national security concept is really um, heavy on internal security compared to what you know we in the United States or Canada might think of when we use the term national security. It is explicitly um, founded on an idea of political security for the party state. So it's a regime security concept. Um, there's a, a piece just in People's Daily this morning repeating this theme that political security for China's socialist system and the leadership of the Central Committee with Xi Jinping at the core is really at the heart of the comprehensive national security concept. So it is fundamentally political and about party power. And then the third aspect of it that I think is really important for all of us to be aware of is that um, in many ways, this sort of um, Xi Jinping's adoption of this um, concept has been intended to push the party toward an, an extremely preventive model of dealing with challenges to internal stability or the party's internal hold on power. And one of the terms that often gets used is prevention and control. Um, that actually is a term that has dual use in um, epidemic and public health discourse in China, but also in, has a long history discursively in public um, security. And so the two have really kind of intertwined in, under COVID um, in some very interesting ways that, that we can come back to if, um, if people are interested. But the, this is where the surveillance state really comes in and comes to the fore because it's this surveillance state that enables the state to sort of pursue this goal of prevention. In fact, one of the phrases you'll hear sometimes in officially, official party documents that go back to this 2014, 2015 period um, is this phrase that basically translates to um, the goal of creating a multidimensional system of information-based prevention and control for political and social security. I think that's just as much of a mouthful in Chinese as it is in in um, uh, in English. But the idea is that information technology really is a key tool for achieving this extraordinarily preventive version of of internal security. Um, 
And so as a result, one of the things we've seen is just a pretty massive set of investments at the local level. Um, so a lot of China's domestic security spending occurs at the provincial or even sub-provincial level, and not at the level of the central government, And although there is some of that. And we've just seen massive investments at the provincial and local level in information technology, in surveillance platforms. And I'll note that one of the really important things about this technology is not just you know, sort of the fancy gadgets that are easy to take pictures of, but as some of, you know, Paul's reporting and other people's work has, has really shown, um, these back-end platforms that are able to integrate different types of data um, become really important for the state actually deploying the information that it collects um, in order to prevent and control any challenges to, to party rule. Um, Final point for all of us, so, so that has some real implications for human rights domestically in terms of Xinjiang, but also in terms of human rights in China writ large. But I guess the final point, and, and I'll close um, here before, before we, we move more to discussion, is just that this is also um, a real issue for the world because Chinese tech companies have been actively involved in exporting these the hardware and these platforms, these backend platforms that I just mentioned, to other countries. Um, I've been kind of trying to track the export of this surveillance technology and platforms like Huawei's Safe City platform or um, or similar comparable um, exports from other Chinese tech companies are now operating in at least 80, maybe closer to 90 countries around the world. So this is really an issue that is not just about human rights in China um, and the implications for rights and freedoms in China, but also a question of global standard setting of the global norms around the use of surveillance technology who gets to write those rules and and you know for those of us today what role the U the united states and canada can and should be playing in those those processes at the global level so i'll stop there thanks thank you sheena for that detailed overview um now we know I, exactly why we invited you that was really on point thank you so much for sharing sharing that i think it's now a perfect segue to talk a bit about canada and so we're going to ask margaret to take the floor, because I think there's been a lot of interesting things happening in Canada on this issue, particularly of, with Chinese tech companies. So, Margaret, I'd like to, to ask you to, um, to say a few words. Thanks, Kyle, and um, I'm really pleased to be here among these stellar colleagues. So I come at these issues as someone who collaborated with Chinese colleagues for four decades to build China's innovation system. And I've studied the problems that Western technology companies have had in China. I've also been engaged in issues related to human rights in China since I visited the Xidan Democracy Wall in 1979. There was a, such a hope back then for China to develop an advanced progressive society, but instead it's now using technological advancement to repress its citizens in a multitude of ways. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about the involvement of Canadian researchers in this. I've been briefing Canadian government officials over the past few years about China's technology for facial recognition, such as sense times and voice recognition, such as iFlytex, which are targeting in the first instance, cultural and religious minorities for closer surveillance. But they're now starting to expand into other communities as well. Canadian universities are implicated in partnering with these companies for technology development. It became uh, public in June of this year that the University of Alberta's AI hub, AMI, has been partnering with the Hong Kong AI Institute funded by SenseTime. This and other revelations led to the Alberta government uh, launching a review of its collaborations with China and a federal review has also been conducted. This has led some Canadian universities to actually try to conceal their own Chinese collaborations by deleting evidence of them from their websites, when in fact the activities themselves are continuing. So for example, we saw the U of A hub delete the announcement of their partnership with the Hong Kong Institute to develop collaboration projects and connections between innovators, but the Hong Kong Institute's website still features the U University of Alberta hub as a strategic partner, along with Al Alibaba and a couple of others. Similarly, when Toronto's York University was challenged for partnering with iFlytech, they took the name iFlytech off the lab that the Chinese company has funded and said that the project was complete, even though it was not in fact complete because of COVID. 
and the anticipated uh, date of completion on the website was um, indefinite, as they called it. Um, so transparency should be a watchword of Canadian universities, especially when it comes to partnerships with China. And most will not reveal the amount of funding they're getting from China for their research. In August, the Canadian government announced it would require national security assessments by our uh, Natural Sciences uh, Granting Council um, for university collaborations with Chinese technology companies in strategic technology fields, including the surveillance sector. So that's a really important first step, but it doesn't address privately funded joint research or military university collaborations or PLA scientists and engineers in Canadian universities, nor does it uh, address genomic research collaborations with China's BGI that has seen the genomic RNA of some Canadian women sent to China for inclusion in its massive BGI-run genomic data bank and for possible resale in BGI's Dr. Tom services. So um, I'm told that the requirement for national security assessments will be expanded, and I hope that that's going to happen soon. And I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Margaret, uh, for that overview, particularly of the, um, the problem of Canadian universities that, who are unwilling or unable to see uh, how part of the collaboration might be used for authoritarian purposes. Um, I now um, would like to ask Aniki to uh, take the floor and, and, and make an opening statement. Um, thank you so much, Kyle. Um, it is fantastic to be here today and I'm astonished to be on such an esteemed um, panel. My name is Aineke Rikkonen and I'm a research assistant at the Center for New American Security in Washington, DC, working on the Technology and National Security Program. At CNES, my work has a national security bent, but because of digital authoritarianism, many of the lines between traditional national security and human rights issues are becoming very, very blurry. China is increasingly implementing tools of social control domestically, but tools to acquire and also to manipulate the information space are seeping internationally as well through the digital Silk Road, 5G, and other telecommunications projects and the proliferation of digital media platforms. Push factors for China are to create conditions amenable to the CCP's governance, speaking, of course, to Sheena's remarks. Um, but internationally, I believe it's also important to acknowledge the pull factors as well. There are very strong global demand signals to modernize infrastructure. So infrastructure week, as we call it, um, in, is in many ways not just an American phenomenon. And then also tools of governance. The US policy response has been rather belated and very piecemeal in terms of posing alternatives and shoring up connections with allies, but there's great opportunity to be had. From a US perspective, like-minded nations like Canada will be really critical for this effort. So I really um, look forward to the rest of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Aineke, for your opening remarks. So I, I, I've got a set of questions that we've prepared. Um, and the first one, I'd like to open up to everyone. Paul talked a bit about this, but it's about these digital technologies for surveillance um, and how um, these tools are being used both internally in, in China, um, particularly against minorities like the Uyghurs, as well as externally, as they're being exported. I'm wondering if, if maybe, maybe start with Paul. Paul, like, how is it a challenge to investigate which companies are involved in um, in the surveillance of these minorities. And then passing on to the other audience, you could maybe some of you could talk about, who, well, who are these companies? How are they expanding? Where do they operate? And, and what's behind this whole digital uh, surveillance infrastructure that's being built in China? Paul, maybe you can maybe tell us a bit about, about your, start off about, about your work as a journalist of trying to uncover um, these issues. Yeah, sure. So one of the um, I was I was uh, out of China for about three years, from 2014 to 2017, when I was in you know Hong Kong, and so I came back to mainland China. And one of the things that had happened during that time, that little gap that I was gone, is that sort of cameras had gone up everywhere. And it's not just like a couple of cameras. You know, it's it's a level of uh, a camera presence where you know any block in say Shanghai or Beijing, I would say would have triple, quadruple the amount of cameras that you would see in say Times Square uh, in New York, for instance. So this sort of 
really set off a kind of, you know, an alarm and a light bulb where you're looking at this stuff and saying the entire, you know, if a surveillance infrastructure has gotten to the point where it's sort of disfigured the urban landscapes around you uh, to such a degree that it's just sort of there. And, and what was remarkable about it too is that, you know, oftentimes the cameras will be at head level because, you know, the better, you know, a, a shot it gets of your face, the better it can do its job. And so you'd be going through a, you know, a subway checkpoint and, you know, you have a camera literally maybe six feet off the ground, a couple meters off the ground, just looking directly uh, into your face. Um, so it's quite obtrusive. And so it made you kind of have to ask this question as a technology journalist, what's going on there and, and who is controlling this? Um, and so that led to a, you know, a long kind of uh, pursuit digging into this stuff. Um, you know, I think maybe just to quickly identify, there's a, a several big uh, AI startups uh, that are, are kind of some of the more important uh, uh, names in this stuff. Uh, Hick Vision, Dahua, um, Sense Time, uh, Meg V, uh, are, are, and E2 is, is, is the fifth. Um, and then there's some sort of old kind of uh, companies that are around companies like Huawei and ZTE that also uh, do a lot of this. On the back end, the software side, Alibaba and Baidu are also a part of this as well. Um, and so in looking into this stuff, you know, for one, you would look at what the companies uh, were saying. And so that meant, you know, going to conferences and going to interview the companies. And, you know, in 2017, 2018, they weren't as sort of aware that this was a problem. And so you would hear all kinds of things. Um, you know, they'd be happy to brag about how their cameras could follow somebody around the, uh, you know, around the city and, and how they were specifically building dossiers of, of Uyghurs uh, in places like Xinjiang. Um, and then over the course of our reporting, starting to come out and revealing this stuff and how, how opaque it was and, and how invasive it was, um, they started sort of battening down the hatches. And then, you know, the one way to report really became going to, to places where people were being surveilled and trying to talk to the people being surveilled and looking at the technology itself. And then really sort of canvassing conferences and other places like that, where you just run into salesmen who don't really have the, uh, the censorship gene because they're trying to impress you. And then they would sort of yak on indefinitely about capabilities and you'd sort of get ideas and then go back and look into government records, things like procurement documents, you know, we also kind of set up a way to pull down a lot of databases, police databases that were left open so that we could understand what data was being sucked up by the police as they set these things up as well. Um, and just to kind of, I'll, I'll try and end really quickly, but the amount of data being pulled in is remarkable. Um, and the uh, sort of level of sophistication on the back end is growing in by leaps and bounds each year. Um, you know, Five, six years ago, when we think about the ability to identify a single person from a single shot from a video camera, it's very, very difficult. Now they're quite good at that. Um, and the more data you have, the better you know, uh, algorithms get at being able to identify a person. But it's not all just about sort of one-to-one -one identifying. It's also about identifying characteristics, um, things like what car you're driving, what your shirt looks like, whether your car has entered a city before, if you're an ethnic minority, um, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, if you look like somebody who's mentally handicapped, you know, on and on. Uh, there's sort of no oversight to any of this. And so the sky's the limit in terms of sort of kind of kooky, um, uh, 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 invasive uh, things. And I, just to, to end, I remember at one conference I ran into a guy who was talking about prison beds, um, you know, and what he wanted to do. And it's very, very basic technology. This isn't hard. Put a bunch of sensors in a, in a mattress and put it in a prison. And then you can map the heartbeats of all of the prisoners as they sleep. And so you can see if anybody might be awake um, or if anybody's, you know, heart is beating too quickly, you know, for their pace, et cetera. And it creates this kind of new, almost sort of biological level of surveillance that's incredibly invasive. Um, and, you know, this person was utterly unashamed about it. It was to them, you know, this was for, you know, uh, uh, camps in Xinjiang that he was talking about this technology. It was just sort of how nifty it was to apply these sensors to this new thing. So, so there really was this sort of this sort of boom over the past few years in the ways that this technology was being used with very little kind of, you know, desire to stop it. The sky was the limit. Um, and what we're sort of seeing emerge today is, is the sort of full realization of that. Thank you, Paul. Um, uh, you left, you had a lot of comments that, that really um, stuck with me. And, and one is that the lack of oversight in China and how you know, authoritarian government can can do things that, that no one or checks and balances in the West. And another thing that jumps at me is that it seems that, you know, in the US, Canada, other countries around the world, a lot of people aren't aware about what these companies are doing and they're moving into our societies. Um, and even the UN at the 75th anniversary, they had a partnership with, with Tencent and they had to pull back because of surveillance uh, of Uyghurs. So it's it's quite frightening. Uh, Sheena, Margaret, and Aniki, do you have, would you like to add to any comments or something more about the, the external part of this that, that you think that we need to discuss? I'll, I'll start with Sheena and then go down to Margaret and Aniki. 
Yeah, happy to. I think there are a couple of um, really important points here in, in what Paul is saying that I wanted to draw out and amplify. Um, first of all, is this idea that when this technology was first introduced, um, the party state ended up suddenly with collection capabilities that, that massively outstripped their ability to analyze and use the data in governance, whether that was targeting social services, providing social services, or you know the much more coercive and invasive parts of surveillance and social control. Um, but that gap is is closing rapidly. The party state knows it talks about um, openly about the the problem of information islands. That information is collected, but it's not being put together in the right ways, and it's not flowing within the party state the way that they they want it to to get maximum usage from from what they're collecting. Um, and so I think we just we just need to be aware that that. Um, yes, these gaps have existed. Um, the, the Chinese leadership is quite aware of that and is actively working to fix that that problem and to hone the analytical capability that it needs to get get um, get what it wants from the data that it's it's collecting. Um, second point that I think is is really important um, that was kind of implicit in what what Paul was saying, but that I wanted to to really draw out because it's important both within China and again at the global level, is that. You know, a lot of the technology that we see and we read about in Xinjiang was actually incubated and experimented with first in urban centers on the East Coast. The state council actually had a couple of prefectures, I think around 20, that it picked as pilot districts for some of these types of information system and surveillance system projects um, in the early to, to mid 2010s, um, maybe even a, a year or two before that. I'd have to go back and check the exact date. Um, and at the time, Xinjiang was actually lagging behind in its investment in surveillance and, and things like that. Um, and that was really concerning to Xi Jinping, and particularly at the time that this, this comprehensive national security concept was deployed, counterterrorism was really front and center in, in Xi Jinping's thinking. He made this trip out to Xinjiang in 2014. There were a couple of incidents around the time of his trip. Um, and so there was this really pretty... Um, quick pivot of the comprehensive national security concept to thinking about Xinjiang again in, in Chinese framing. This is a counterterrorism issue, um, and so what became really important um, is is just and the point that I want to highlight for all of us to think about is that some of the technological tools that we see in Xinjiang um, not only were developed in the east but were applied there and, and used on citizens and populations and urban spaces first. Um, and so part of the issue is that they were used for different political projects and political purposes. So something that was sort of, um, you know, somewhat coercive and um, the possibility of it being abused and used to violate human rights was was always there in the the urban East. But when it moved to the, the setting of Xinjiang, um, where the party state had these uh, you know, much more expansive aims and was willing to engage in much higher levels of, of repression, um, then the technology took on sort of a, a different political role. Um, and it really was used to facilitate this massive escalation in collective repression that occurred in the spring of 2017 um, that the United States now has, has um, the State Department has found meet the criteria for um, both genocide and crimes against humanity. Um, and so um, you know, the, the point here, again, for global politics, too, is we've seen some democracies that have bought some of this technology from, from China. Um, so the issue is partly one of what these technical capabilities are and whether democracies should be acquiring them at all. But there's also then the second question of for the democracies where there's a city or a province that's already acquired a, a, a capability or a system like this, what are the legal and political and regulatory frameworks or rules that can be applied to ensure adequate democratic oversight of these systems, to ensure that civil liberties are respected, to ensure that they're not used to violate or abuse human rights. Um, and I, I'd agree with Aniki's point earlier that the United States has been sort of slow to think through some of these questions and that the global conversation is still really underdeveloped. Um, David Kay, he's one of the UN Special Rapporteurs for, for Surveillance and, and Human Rights, um, has talked a lot about the need for a much more robust um, conversation about what the standards around the development, the export, 
and the use of surveillance technology should be. Um, and so again, that's something where I think the United States, Canada, other like-minded democracies, um, allies and partners um, can probably uh, play a real role. Um, but this is pretty urgent because the, the landscape has shifted and now we're in the business of, of playing catch up. But the, the sort of the key point is that we need to think both about what these capabilities are and can do, but then also what are the political, regulatory and legal tools that we might have to figure out how to keep them in check when that's appropriate for a, a democratic political system. Thanks. Thank you, Sheena. Um, a lot to um, digest there. So much to cover. I would like to maybe flip, go to Ikini next, and and then and then to Margaret. Um, Aniki, um, you talked a bit about. We're talking about digital authoritarianism and surveillance, but you also said you did some work on five G, and the issue about Huawei has been front and center on a lot of concerns about um, about privacy surveillance. I'm wondering if you could maybe talk about what some of the concerns are about five G, and then I'd like Margaret to come in because this is an issue that the Canadian government is the only government in the G7 that hasn't really shut the door yet. So, so or the, among the five eyes, pardon me, the five eyes partners. So I'd like to, Aniki, maybe you could comment on that and we'll ask Margaret to do a follow-up. I think part of what's so interesting about the 5G um, sort of debacle is that it's so interdisciplinary. Um, and so you have the technology element, you know, in what ways can it be abused um, as you have um, the ability to suck up more information? What does it mean for um, the internet of things or you know, smart cities and um, these big sensor ecosystems that might come into play? Um, but um, it's kind of shaken up the whole conception that we have about um, cybersecurity um, very broadly. You know, how do you assess vendor risks? And some of those will not be technical, but also political. Um, in this case, you know, looking at how susceptible um, private companies are to influence by China's government um, and whether they might then um, pass over data upon request. Um, and so in response to this, um, interestingly enough, it's not just about the technology. It's not even just about, um, you know, the politics, but even looking at the market for 5G equipment. Um, why is it that there's an oligopoly on U.S. networks um, and how if that is the problem, do we then open up the playing field to alternatives? And so then coming back to technical standards like um, interoperability to open that up. And so um, part of what's been interesting about following this conversation, um, not only can it be very convoluted, but there's some really creative um, solutions that you can um, point to if you're willing to sort of you know, untangle the, the web of what are all of the contributing factors, what are the structural components, um, and then thinking about, you know, how government and private sector um, can really work together to formulate some openings for alternatives. Thank, thank you, Aniki, uh, for, for talking about the complexity of the 5G to YY debate. Margaret, maybe you talked a bit about companies that we should be fearful of that have engaged in human rights abuses, and, and but maybe you can talk a bit more about that, but also talk about uh, what's happening in Canada about Huawei and the 5G. Right, so Huawei is a, a critical issue for the Canadian government. It's been under review for more than three years. And it, along with some other things the Canadian government hasn't been doing on China that would be criticized by China, I think they've just been holding back. They've been very meek. Uh, they've got the two Michaels um, as hostage. They want to be very careful. Uh, so uh, hopefully after this uh, September 20th election, we'll see a real decision. But they have been signaling that the most important criterion um, for the Huawei decision is uh, national security. So I think that's a very good um, signal. Um, Huawei itself has been doing uh, research on, um, uh, for example, testing AI that would pick a Uyghur out of a big crowd and automatically send an, uh, an alarm to the police. Um, and uh, so, you know, and, and companies like CPP, IBR, and the CAS are um, pension investment companies that have billions uh, to invest around the world are very heavily invested in China and Alibaba and Tencent uh, that are implicated again in uh, some of these uh, technologies. Um, there has been a, a move in Canada to try to get them to divest. Um, but it's very hard to get the company's attention. They say they review their investments and uh, they claim to have an ethical lens, but, but then they invest in these kinds of technologies, which is crazy. Um, Human Rights Watch uh, did an interesting um, reverse engineering 
of a police app in Xinjiang, uh, where the police officers were inputting detailed behaviors of uh, Uyghurs if they went out the back door of their house that was surreptitious and, uh, and therefore that would be noted. And people were being put in the camps on the basis of this uh, police app. So this is the importance of algorithms, just like, you know, at the time that COVID was first emerging, um, the, uh, there, there were, was an algorithm to, to censor key words. But the implication of that was that doctors uh, on the ground trying to deal with the disease were not able to send messages on WeChat to one another because they were all getting censored. So they couldn't share notes. So that too is, uh, is concerning. And then, you know, we, for Uyghurs here in Canada, uh, there's been the experience of hackers from China getting into, uh, through Facebook, into their email accounts and identifying exactly what they're saying to others on, on email and, um, and plans to um, uh, have protests. Uh, all of this thing is, uh, these things are being tracked in China. Um, so, you know, as you say, this is being, is happening abroad, not just within the country. Thank you, Margaret. Um, before I go to my next question, um, we still have about 25 minutes left. Uh, people that are following, if you have any question, please um, submit it via Facebook or YouTube. Um, we have three channels uh, where people are listening in, uh, 60, 60 people on this one, but probably another 100 or so on the other two. Um, so please, um, we really want to take questions uh, from you. So if you have some, please formulate them and send them to us sooner rather than later. Um, I would like to move to perhaps another aspect of this, which is not really about surveillance, um, but more about um, how digital technologies are being used uh, or how in particular artificial intelligence advances in China are being used to enable media manipulation and advance the liberal uses of technologies, disinformation campaigns online. We've, we've seen some um, what Facebook calls inauthentic behavior around Hong Kong, uh, mass growth of AI powered bots going after critics of, of China on, on the case of the Uyghur genocide. I'm wondering um, if I could ask all of you to think about this and maybe start with Paul and see based on your reporting, what are you seeing on the use of these technologies in the information landscape? Yeah, sure. So um, the AI component of it, I don't think is is quite that. Um, I mean, it's important, but it's perhaps not the most important part. Um, where we see AI come in is things like um, you know you'll hear uh, from people designing censorship software that you know they create um, uh, automatic recognition of something like a tank for Tian the Tiananmen Square anniversary. So all of a sudden you have a smart algorithm that in any video can see a tank and know that it's a tank. And they do this for candles too. Um, so the idea that you know the moment anything pops up in a video, and video is very difficult to monitor because you, you know, you'd have to sit somebody there watching it the whole time generally. Um, and that, you know, that means millions of hours of stuff to go through, which you know you just don't have the manpower to do. And so what AI allows you to do is to automate this process and to kind of create sort of models that allow you to look for images and things that, that you wouldn't otherwise see. Uh, on the text side as well, it's really important because you wouldn't necessarily know what everybody's saying. And so uh, there's there's a move to kind of turn everything people are saying in video and audio, the massive amounts of video and audio on various apps and turn it directly into text. And then if that text contain certain sensitive words, then you immediately cut a live stream or you flag it for a human uh, to review. So what it's effectively doing is taking us from the level of you know very, very strong control over text to very strong control over these much more media rich uh, sort of ways that we live online today. Um, but there is a sort of other side to internet control, which is is also just there is a lot of manpower uh, within China and outside of China being thrown at it. Um, the best way to fool, um, you know, uh, what be it sort of, you know, a Twitter uh, a, a troll tracking software uh, or YouTube or whomever is to actually have real people doing this stuff. And, and there are plenty of times where it, what, what looks to be click farms and, and comment farms that exist, you know, to sort of systematically troll people like myself and probably the, you know, the other panelists here as well, um, to go after them anytime they say something. And we found lists that you know, show that, that, that journalists and government officials and so on are, are, are sort of uh, uh, on those lists. And then the final point I'll say is you know, we got a very 
large leak out of the Cyberspace Administration of China, which is effectively the, the internet regulator, last year. And, and what it showed is really that there's an entire sophisticated bureaucracy that's grown up around controlling the internet within China. It used to be that the companies were mostly left to kind of censor on their own, and if something got out of control, they were punished. Now you actually have, you know, on a county by county level, uh, a, a series of staff who actually monitor local social media to see anything that could potentially go viral or be dangerous, and who use spies within local chat groups, um, and who have have pull on a large number of real people, usually younger students, uh, who can astroturf um, and, and put positive comments up about new local policies or local politicians. And so they kind of pull on all of these levers uh, with, a, with a human brain uh, uh, to manipulate what's going on uh, locally on the internet. And we saw this used to incredible effect uh, at, in, in the initial outbreak of the coronavirus, uh, you know, which became probably the largest single internet censorship event uh, the world has ever known, uh, in which you know, just massive amounts of mourning for Li Wenliang, um, you know, the doctor who tried to warn people about COVID and ultimately succumbed to it and died, uh, you know, the way he was mourned online and the way that was ultimately censored. So, um, you know, and, and, and as we go forward, I think in the future, we will see these these algorithms get get better and better. Um, but I don't know that uh, you know for the foreseeable future, I do think we will have humans there, and it's a matter of how to slowly deploy the manpower. And so the automation kind of sits on the back end and gets you to look at the you know if you're if you're a sensor to look at the candle or the the tank or the person who says you know Tibet independence on a live stream, and that's sort of how it will work. Thank you, Paul. Um, Sheena, are you any of your research touching on, on this issue uh, in the information domain? Um, you know, I've looked a little bit at the the role of some of this, but I guess that, you know, the concern that I have as we think again about sort of the global conversation on surveillance, on technology, on human rights, and on digital authoritarianism is the potential for some of these tech tools, video technology, um, not just to be used to censor or mold online conversation, um, but actively to claim that some of the documentation that is genuine about human rights abuses is manipulated or fake. Um, and so, you know, we've seen, you can do this at a, a much lower tech, um, sort of using a much lower tech set of methods with clever video editing and the introduction of things that look like evidence, but that somebody doesn't necessarily have time to read and consider a document carefully. Um, but, it, you know, to the extent that physical access to areas is limited, as it has been in places like Xinjiang, but also globally in, in other places like North Korea or parts of, of Myanmar, um, then, you know, sometimes we, we've relied on videos taken by people at the scene who are able to get them out via social media. And if you have states that are then able to say, oh, all of that is some kind of deep fake or that video has been manipulated, this isn't real, um, you can very quickly get into this, um, this area where the basic facts of what's happening on the ground are disputed and challenged and you have a debate about what's real and what's happening rather than what, what needs to be done about it or what um, policy changes need to be adopted. Um, and, you know, we've seen political discourse get sort of stuck and start spinning when that happens in any number of, of other contexts recently. Um, and so, although I don't, I, I can't think of a case necessarily in which that's happened on a large scale um, yet, uh, I think it's something for human rights activists to start thinking quite carefully about um, how, you know, the, if the state has really advanced technology and can either generate um, videos that look real but aren't, or claim that real videos are not real. Um, you know, how do we think about the the balance of power between activists and human rights advocates on the one hand, and states that are developing these fairly advanced capabilities on the other? Um, I don't have a good answer, but it's just a, a question and a point that I wanted to raise because I think it's something we will all need to think through at some some point here. Um, but I know Aniki's work and, and maybe Margaret has touched on some of this as well, so so maybe they have more to say. Sure, um, Margaret, I'd like to ask you. You you've written a lot, taken a public stance on these issues. You've written op eds for all Canada's major newspapers. You're on doing TV interviews. Have you seen a rise of of you know either real accounts or fake accounts going after you on social media because of that? Um, I got caught actually on the weekend. 
uh, with one that said that uh, Huawei was pulling out of uh, 5G in Canada and, uh, and was not going to allow any Canadian companies to use any of its patents. And uh, so that, that's the, the only one that I've seen myself. Um, but it was quite a, a dramatic piece and, and on the face of it looked real, but then it turned out it wasn't. Um, you know, when you, when you have a couple of journalists look at it uh, quickly, then they can usually get to the root of it. So uh, Paul may have seen that particular one floating around in the last few days. Um, the thing that I've been looking at with great concern is what's going on with WeChat and the, the um, uh, software and the algorithms that are being applied there to identify what people are saying to one another and then using keywords against them uh, in what's called their social credit score. This is a system that is still developing in Canada, in China. It's not completely networked across the country yet. Um, but it, it is designed to uh, give credits or points uh, if you are an upstanding citizen and take them away if you mention June 4th or uh, don't pay your bills or don't take your garbage out on time. There's a, a number of different ways of monitoring and all of this is inputted into this system that's developing there. A lot of Chinese themselves aren't aware of something called the social credit system but uh, they know all about the blacklists, which is if you get on a blacklist, you can't uh, go on high-speed trains, you can't fly in planes, uh, you may not be able to go to university, your kids can't go to good schools, you might uh, not get a job promotion. So, you know, those are the things that people uh, are quite aware of and uh, millions of people have been punished under this system so far. And it's being expanded into companies doing business in China through the corporate social credit system and foreign companies included. And so foreign companies have to give all of their data to um, Chinese authorities. And, uh, and so that is a vulnerability then for foreign companies as well. So this is just it has been going since 2016. I deleted my own WeChat app uh, when when I uh, first saw that this developing, and it'll be interesting to see what impact that has on the society in the longer term. Thanks, Margaret. Um, Aniki, I'm not sure if you have comments on this, but I also realized the U.S. military banned some of its members from using TikTok. Um, not sure if you've done work on this, but do you have anything um, to add to the discussion on on these points? Um, yes, yeah, so we've heard about um, content detection deepfakes and these data-driven blacklists. And I would also add, I suppose in the spirit of TikTok, um, concerns about micro-targeting as well. And, and so that's when you have um, you know, content recommendation algorithms that suggest material to you. Um, I believe in China, they've been subject to export controls actually as a national security interest, um, which added a wrinkle into sort of this attempt to split TikTok from its um, parent company. But I think some of the challenge with it um, is that it inherently proliferates narratives that users are open to um, as it's personalizing what you see. And so what this might mean is you might get the same message or narrative um, that's packaged in different ways. And then you kind of see amongst users um, what sticks. And then in an environment that's censored, you know, you won't have the alternatives. And so um, some scholars have called this um, digital nationalism. Um, in terms of how this happens across platforms, though, I think it's interesting that um, Russia still seems very much ahead in terms of um, leveraging these algorithms on Western platforms like Twitter, but it is kind of a different game um, when the platform is actually owned um, by a company that is subject to a country's influence. Um, and so I think that's kind of a different game. And as some of these um, social media platforms proliferate, um, we'll see what happens. I think, you know, TikTok is perhaps not the most urgent example so much as sort of our warning light of you know things that might be to come if we're not paying attention and taking a more more coordinated and less ad hoc response. Thank you. So I'd like to now we have about 15 minutes left or, or a little bit less to turn to questions from the audience. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Not sure who wants to volunteer for this one um, or who's best uh, position to answer this but one question coming in is from Frank Chalk who's asking how does the C, um, how does the Chinese um, Communist Party leadership engage with China's surveillance tech innovators and coordinate with them? So how does the government there engage with China's surveillance tech innovators companies to coordinate all of this? Who would like to, um, to uh, comment on this? Who, who, who has knowledge of how this, how this works? 
Um, so I think this is probably something that, that Paul can speak to as well, but, um, but one of the ways that we've seen that the party state has been very effective at shaping the surveillance ecosystem writ large in, in China um, is through the, the procurement contracts that it makes available. The reality is that a lot of tech companies in China are really dependent on um, or have been dependent on these local and provincial government um, bids to, uh, to develop technology and then to be able to, to be commercially viable. Um, so I think it's important to note that the procurement environment in China has had a huge effect on the development a lot of, of a lot of these these companies, and has also affected which of them are sort of domestically focused versus now turning to thinking about or which which have which ones have gradually turned to marketing their products uh, externally and and globally. Um, the other thing is that Xi Jinping has really tried to strengthen party. Um, governance within large corporations. There are rules now about how big, uh, you know, that companies of a certain size have to have party cells um, or party bodies within them. Um, and so that gives people, um, that gives the party an additional opportunity to have a say in the, the governance of tech. There's also just a, a whole a whole raft of, of laws. Xi Jinping's passed about 20 different laws in, in the national security space, not all of which have implications for tech. Um, but things around data security, um, around other, you know, um, then the national intelligence law, which was uh, passed in 2017. Um, there are about probably a half dozen laws that have real implications for um, the tech sector and how it can and is required to, to relate to the party state. Um, but, but others may have a bit more detail to add on that. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else have anything to say, Paul? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, I can um, just a, a quick thing to add there too. Uh, what's you know basically on a fundamental level, the local governments and local police, you know, for the these sort of AI companies and, and surveillance companies, will come to the companies and say, "Can you do this? Can you do that?" And there's a sort of active sales relationship. I mean, you know, much like contractors uh, you would think of in the United States. Um, but what's interesting is so much money has flowed into the surveillance um, technologies in recent years that it actually, in some ways, has influenced how uh, artificial intelligence technologies itself. Uh, have developed within China. Um, you know, I remember talking to E2 a few years ago, which is one of the leading, uh, you know, facial recognition companies, and they just gotten a huge contract for Chinese customs to do the facial recognition anytime anybody crosses a Chinese border. Um, but they were also working with a couple of hospitals on uh, technology designed to help uh, identify uh, lung cancer uh, in, in, in scans. And and ultimately, you know, they had about three or four people working on the, the lung scan project and 200 working on the, uh, the, the, the surveillance and security of the border because that was where the money was and that was sort of what came in. And so you saw a lot of companies with really good AI thinkers who were putting out feelers in a bunch of different places, but, you know, running a startup was very difficult. And when you need that money, you'll take what you can get. And a lot of them got steered into the surveillance side of things out of that kind of just raw demand. So in some ways, this sort of government desire for surveillance perverted the market forces and pushed a lot of these, a lot of this AI technology down one pipeline uh, within China. Thank you, Paul. Margaret, I see you raising your hand. Yeah, I, I would just add that um, Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang have done a, quite a remarkable job uh, of leadership on technology. Uh, when he came in, uh, she uh, uh, put in a process for major changes in governance of the innovation system, uh, wound up more than 100 government programs and put in place five uh, program areas. So it really, really took a hands-on approach to that. that. Um, Li Keqiang has been a, a big advocate for startup incubators and accelerators uh, for small and medium-sized companies in China. And, you know, so a lot of this is visionary and then it trickles down into, you know, how do they implement that? Um, but if I look around the world at those leaders who are really engaged on innovation and technology, I would say uh, the premier and secretary general are, um, are among the, the leaders. Thank you, Margaret. Um, Ainiki, do you have anything you'd like to add or should I move to the next question? 
Um, yes, I would just add internationally, um, looking also at um, China's industrial policy and some of its, you know, well-funded or well-subsidized um, foreign policy initiatives like the Belt and Road um, Initiative, very famous, or um, the Digital Silk Road as well. Um, if you have a market where um, the cheapness of products are tipped in favor of companies, um, countries are more likely to buy them, um, even if they come with significant surveillance risks. Thank you. So we're going to take one last question from the audience um, because we don't have that much time left and everyone's busy and has things after this. So I'm going to put it up on the screen um, and it says, great insights. This is from Peter Francopan. Great insights. Thank you. What, if anything, of do we know about how and where this data is processed? What kind of organizational structures manage the data and are, are there good ways it gets used? Thank you. So this is about the data, data privacy rights and companies collaborating. Uh, does anyone have an insight in this or would like to um, take a stab at this question? Uh, yeah, I can, I guess I can take the first step. Um, the, um, so that, you know, basically at a, at a local level um, uh, or at a provincial level, you'll have uh, different companies bid on these contracts. And usually what they'll do is build out on behalf of the, the police or whoever is collecting the data, uh, you know, a repository. Um, and, and that's kind of the data islands that China talked about kind of get created when you have one set of companies, you know, in Sichuan, say, and another set of companies in Yunnan uh, that are that are building kind of, you know, systems that don't necessarily talk to each other in terms of how the data is stored, what data is collected, how it's analyzed, et cetera. And so there's a sort of national program to slowly flatten that and make a kind of set of standards so that all this can sort of, uh, you know, all these different systems uh, can talk to each other. Um, there are lots of good ways that this stuff is being used and, and the Chinese Chinese officials are very quick to point it out. Um, you know, there are, are things, you know, I, I think in Shanghai at some point they'd say, oh, you know, if people are, are doing construction past a certain hour or, you know, uh, not wearing helmets, our camera, you know, construction men aren't wearing helmets, uh, our, our cameras will identify it. Um, there's all kinds of, you know, Alibaba makes claims to sort of fixing some of Hangzhou's uh, traffic problems. Hangzhou is famous for, for terrible, terrible traffic. Um, you know, so all of these ideas, um, like I knew he said about sort of, you know, a smart city and this idea that you can use data to better run an urban area are kind of embedded in the surveillance side as well. Um, and so, you know, another thing is like, for instance, finding finding children who have been kidnapped, um, you know, uh, uh, via recognition or via, via DNA. Um, but ultimately what happens is these, these things sort of get packaged all together. Um, so, you know, the thing that fixes your traffic situation or tries to streamline your, your traffic lights uh, for the morning rush hour is also keeping an eye out for any car that has never entered a certain district before um, and then grabbing the rust patterns on the side of that car and identifying, you know, if it's from Xinjiang, maybe it needs to be looked at. Um, and so all these things are kind of, you know, sort of layered on top of each other um, and what's interesting is, you know, the Chinese approach is so sort of uh, 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 all in one that when these these systems get exported and sold, which they're being done, you know, which is happening all across the world, uh, you get it all at once. And so you get the traffic control system, you get the weather prediction, you get the ability to kind of do disaster management, 9-11 uh, response, you know, 911 responses on top of a really powerful, robust surveillance system. And so when we went to Ecuador to kind of look at this, you know, what we saw is that the, the system could do all these great things, but, um, you know, the, 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 the politician in power, this guy Correa, who was who's sort of a populist um, obsessed with his own political power, was using it to intimidate uh, political rivals primarily. He was not using it to solve, you know, petty street crime or drug, you know, drug use or any, anything like that. It was, it was, it was purely a, a used as a political weapon because that was the easiest way to use it. And ultimately within China, that was sort of what it is built to do primarily. All the rest of this stuff is kind of bells and whistles and, and it's important and it will get better. Uh, and, and Chinese officials will say it's all worth it. Um, but at the end of the day, it brings all that with it. So you have to think, you know, do you really, you know, get enough, um, you know, out of it, given how much privacy is lost? Um, so sorry, I was a bit of wandering, but I, I hope that answers it a bit. Thank you, Paul. Um, so Sheena, we're, you're going to make the last comment. I know you you said you could answer this one. So I'll give you a minute or so um, to make some closing comments and then I will wrap up the session. Great. Yeah, just a second. Some of what, what Paul said originally, a lot of this data was sort of organized and processed at the, the local level where the procurement contract originated. Um, and the, the party state has been working really hard at trying to scale up and integrate these systems and make them interoperable first kind of maybe within a city or within a prefecture and then and then eventually with the, the goal of having them be sort of seamlessly connected nationally. Um, and uh, this is something I, I've done a little bit of work on 
um, with a, a Chinese co-author um, on the role of information control and how that affects governance. And we, we talk a little bit in, in an article, but I'm happy to share if it's helpful, about the fact that this is used for governance, it's used for welfare provision, it's used for, you know, the same platform is used for, for reporting a pothole that needs fixing, um, but then that same person can also come to your house with a police officer to convince you not to file a petition to protest um, a, a local government action or to, to engage in a protest. Um, Jen Pan has this terrific book called Welfare for Autocrats, where she talks about the dual uses of China's welfare system um, that makes it a very similar point that that information is double-edged and that it's used for social services provision and good governance and it's used for really coercive and repressive purposes and that that information has these these dual sides um, that in in um, the way that China has built its system. Um, so so I think that's a really important point to keep in mind again because it, it has similar effects when we start extending those systems beyond um, beyond China's borders. Thank you, Sheena. So I will just make a, a couple um, just couple of short announcements and then a thank yous to the speakers. But first, I want to thank everyone who followed us online today. If you're interested in digital authoritarianism, we're going to be hosting three other events between now and January. So sign up at our Institute's website or follow our Twitter account. We'll announce those shortly, including our final one on what Canadians and Americans can do to, to deal with this global problem. Um, I also want to thank the, um, the uh, U.S. Embassy to Canada and the U.S. Consul to Montreal for the support working on this project. Um, and last but not least, I just want to thank our amazing speakers on behalf of my colleagues at MIGS, um, Margaret, Sheena, Iniki, and Paul. Um, you, it was fascinating. We're going to post this event online to share. Um, but please, if you know anyone else interested in the issue or we should, we should interview, please contact us after and let us know. But I'd just like to thank everyone for joining us today. Thanks, Kyle.